Hello and welcome to this event, KubeCon Digest, Emerging Trends and Takeaways from this year's conference. So today's webinar is sponsored by Portworks by Portworks by Pure Storage and produced by Actual Tech Media. My name is Scott Becker. I'm from Actual Tech Media and I'm excited to be your moderator for this especially timely presentation recapping KubeCon, which, which just wrapped up. So now before we get to today's great content, we do have a few housekeeping items that will help you get the most out of this session. First off, we want this to be an informative event for you, so we encourage any questions in the questions box in your webinar control panel. Not only will we have team members responding to questions during the live event, um, but it's also a great place to let us know about any technical issues that you might be experiencing. Um, a browser refresh will fix most audio, video, and slide advancement issues, but if that doesn't work, just let us know there in the Q&A and we'll provide further technical assistance. Now, second, in the handout section of your webinar control panel, you'll find that we're offering several resources, and I'd especially like to call your attention to a PDF on five challenges that platform engineers face in building a complete IDP. That's a resource from, uh, from Portworks. Um, also in there, you can find some actual tech media links, like a link to the ATM Decisions Group, the ATM Event Center, and uh, ATM's prize terms and conditions, which leads us to the third item, which is at the end of this webinar event, we will be awarding a $250 Amazon gift card to one lucky registrant uh, right here in time, uh, at least in the United States, for, uh, for the holiday season. So, of course, you must be in attendance during the live event to qualify for the prize. Official terms and conditions of today's prize drawing can be found in your handout section. You just scroll to that bottom item there, ATM, prize terms and conditions, and you'll find all the details there. Okay, and with all that housekeeping out of the way, let's get to today's timely discussion. I'm excited now to bring on our expert presenters. We have John Owings, who's Director of Cloud Architecture for Portworks by Pure Storage, and we have Justin Fredrickson, who's Director of Cloud Native Architecture for the Americas uh, for Portworks. So um, I am gonna turn things over to Justin. Hey, welcome. Uh, my name is Justin Fredrickson. I am the Director of Cloud Native Architects here at Portworks. And joining me today is John Owings, who is our Director of Strategy here at Portworks. And we're super excited to uh, to uh, recap our week last week in Chicago. Uh, so uh, this is our KubeCon uh, Digest, and we're going to uh, be discussing some of the emerging trends and uh, our takeaways from this year's conference. And um, uh, just a couple uh, elements of housekeeping. Um, we're going to go through our, our content, but if you guys have questions, please feel free to put them into the Q&A, and uh, we will uh, cover them at the end of the session. And we'd love to, to hear from, from you around what your questions are, uh, since it was an action-packed week, and we're likely not going to be able to cover every single thing that transpired uh, there, but we certainly uh, did see and, and got exposed to a lot, and we can certainly ask uh, or answer some of those questions as they come up. Um, so, um, why don't we get right to it? Um, J.O., yes, yes, exactly. What were your impressions of the event? How, how, what did you think? How was it? It was uh, leaps and bounds uh, above the, the previous one. I feel like everyone was a lot more engaging. There were, uh, obviously, I feel like a lot more people. Attendance uh, was up almost double. So last year uh, was uh, 7,500 people, roughly. Uh, this year uh, was right around 15,000 attendees. Um, the other thing that I, I, I noticed was that, um, you know, it's still very much an open source conference, which is great. That's what makes uh, KubeCon so special uh, compared to, like, say, going to Oracle Open World or an AWS event. You know, this is very much geared towards the open source community. That being said, because of the size, uh, I felt like there was a lot more vendors there. And, and we saw it in, in terms of our own booth. We, from a vendor engagement perspective, Last year, we scanned about 3.5% of the total attendees of 7,500. And uh, this year, we scanned uh, nearly 10% of the attendees. So, so, so much more traffic in the booths. And, and a lot of customers, from my perspective, looked like they were really looking for solutions uh, to you know, complex issues that, uh, that they started to encounter in the last year as they started to move into production. Versus last year, there was seemed to be a little bit more research uh, around uh, you know, how to get uh, to from point A to point B. And, maybe a little bit more focus on, um, you know, observability and things of that nature. Whereas this year, uh, you know, just seemed a little bit more oriented towards production. The other thing that I just noticed as customers came up to me at times is that, you know, it just seems like very much the future is 
is hybrid uh, for a lot of these companies. I, I got a lot of customers uh, coming up to me saying, hey, I got got two different clouds. How can you help me? Uh, and that was that was interesting to see. But and one thing is, I feel like the buzz is is more like the early VMworld days. Mm. For anyone out there that went to those early VMworld, like people are excited to learn and use the technology, which is which is a good thing. It's, we're going in the right spot. And boom, right? You know, I said, hey, how many set, how many mentions of these certain terms and exclude, you know, cloud native, because I think everyone had the word cloud native in their session descriptions. So, and here it is, right? We have, you know, over 300 on um, AI. Now this is obviously generated by AI, so it may be biased, but I don't think it, I don't think it made this up. Um, but yeah, so, you know, the, what I think I've noticed mostly, you know, in the previous years was, you know, security, um, and, you know, CICD development, that type of stuff. And then community things would be top. And this year, like this is a huge shoot up of how to leverage AI. And uh, you can see it right here, like, all these sessions there. Now this is not like, so I'll, I'll correct the chart here, mm -hmm. uh, Jay Fred. Yeah. <laughs> these are mentions, right? Not sessions. So there weren't, you know, there weren't like 1500 sessions. There was more oh. like 400 sessions. <laughs> Got it, got it. Um, so yeah, just to just to correct just to correct everyone and know that like I don't just completely blindly trust uh, ChatGPT to tell me the truth. So there you go. <laughs> good point. Good point. So what do you think the implications are for for these two data points? I mean, I as a vendor, I can certainly see oh, AI and data. That seems that seems awfully appealing for a, a vendor in, in our space where we're providing uh, storage solutions. But uh, you know, do you, do you think this app accurately represents? Um, kind of the buzz and the concerns and focuses for those data platform engineers uh, that are out there? So, I mean, I'd be lying if I didn't say that it was a buzzword. I'm, I'm sure that's what helped get a lot of people's sessions into consideration. It stood out. It's an interesting topic. People want to learn about it. But I think more so is the enterprises want to figure out how, how it applies to them and how to run it on premises, right? Like they don't want, they don't necessarily want to run like a, proprietary model that is locked away and they just send their data to it. They're, they're trying to figure out a way, how do I get the same benefits, but not, you know, not share my data with my competitors. Right. And there's still a lot of mistrust in the, in the, out there in the, in the industry. So, you know, that I would, I would say that was probably one of the top things is, is people are interested in it. They want to know how to run it, but they want to know how to do it in a way that, you know, is open, but with their data doesn't leave their, walls even if those are cloud walls that you know could be in it could be public cloud but they don't want it just off with some other vendor there's in this at this audience these are the this is the people that want to build it themselves right like there's one commonality amongst you know the uh, the attendees is like they're there to to build to learn how to build things right um they're the builders they're not they're not the sales managers uh, maybe there's an element here you know, one of the key things that I kept hearing from customers is that, you know, Kubernetes is by no means a science project anymore. It is firmly established. And, and, and many folks were even talking about, well, is Kubernetes having its Linux moment where it's just accepted and just part of everything? And But maybe AI will help turn the corner, so to speak, in terms of driving uh, easier uh, transitions to be more secure. Um, what other impressions do you see out there? So like we're talking about AI, yeah, let's, let's kind of move to the, the the next thing which is you know what other impressions did you have out there yeah so i um i definitely saw um some more trends emerge around this theme of best practices in particular um some referred to it as uh gold paths or uh a, a, the paved road so to speak and you know that kind of lines up with some of the sessions that that i saw like for example there was a boeing employee that did a a session called clean up on aisle cloud and and you know addressing the complexities of just navigating well which storage uh, architecture should i use to drive the best cost efficiency performance scale and in, in whatever it might be needed um and um in our own sessions as well we had our our, our good friend uh, satish from ford uh get up and talk again on the cube uh which was great and he, he you know he talked about how What's key in this moment, and, and maybe this explains why the the Solutions Pavilion and the Vendor Expo was so so populated and so full of energy, is that people are looking for ways to <coughs> combine 
uh, different uh, technologies to allow the platform to do exactly what they need to do, uh, as opposed to just tinkering around and exploring what they want to do. Now there's a very clear vision of what they want. And so they need the security vendors. They need the automated deployment uh, vendors. They need uh, storage vendors like like uh, like Portworks and Pure Storage. And uh, <coughs> that was just an interesting uh, takeaway that I had. Uh, Gartner too also referenced this as a, as a key consideration uh, as they move forward is this notion of finding a, uh, a defined best practice for maybe an environment running um, a data pipeline for an AI use case or uh, a site re uh, site reliability engineering group running a specific way in, in, in order to drive their elastic or Splunk use cases. So I, I just, I see a little bit more maturation in that regard. Um, and uh, so I, I thought that was interesting. You know, tell me a little bit about uh, just kind of the, the conference as a whole. Like, did you feel like, obviously there was 15,000 people um, you know, new venue in Chicago, you know, different layouts. Uh, what, what were your thoughts uh, around, you know, just the conference as a whole, the whole, the whole kind of environment as we were, as we were in, enjoying it last week? It was, this was like back when I was, I went to Seattle, I was in Austin um, in previous years and San, and San Diego, which were all excellent shows. And this is back on par with that. Uh, it just seems like this conference is, is marching, you know, quicker and quicker towards being, one of the largest conferences uh, that that people attend in a given year, and um, I don't know. I guess I, I, you know, I'm talking myself into the notion that 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 Kubernetes really is having its Linux moment. Um, I sometimes I I vacillate back and forth on that, but um, mm -hmm. but just the energy and the buzz overall. I, the other yeah. thing I did notice too is that, like, I go to I go to a lot of conferences, and you know, I'm going to go to Vegas in the, in the next few weeks for a variety of conferences, and. Uh, I would say that the population of attendees is relatively uh, younger than than um, than what I see at, at those other conferences, and maybe that's a reflection too of the emerging status and uh, of of this particular uh, technology and platform. Yeah, and uh, I think the thing that everyone is, is the the workloads are more mission critical too. So people are they care, right? Yeah. It's not just a science project. It's not just the lab. They're running their business on it, right? We have customers doing that that we talk to every day. They're running their business on it, but you know, not to say that we're representative of the entire world, but like, hey, th there are a lot of customers out there that we've never met that are running very important things, and so it it's key to them to get make sure you know it's secure, it's up, you know, <laughs> all the things that you know you're you're doing with Kubernetes um, in those in those environments. Yeah, you know, actually, that's that's a good point. Um, in my conversations with customers as they came by, um, the tenor of their conversations was was far more different. Um, you know, last year in Detroit, there was a lot of questions. Uh, I kind of alluded to it earlier in the in the talk track here. There were a lot of questions that were research based, um, whereas I had more people coming to the booth saying, "Hey, my partner told me uh, they should come and talk to Portworks." Uh, for its, you know, enterprise reliability and, and, and you know, purpose-built software-defined storage for Kubernetes that can do multi-cloud. Um, you know, that was, they came prepared with why they wanted to spend time at my booth versus, hey, this this looks like a nice shiny booth. Maybe I should talk to these people. Maybe their, maybe their things are, are interesting at their booth. But, you know, people always are excited to pick up um, you know the tchotchkes from the booth but um there was less focus on tchotchkes <laughs> from my perspective and <clears throat> more we were baking we were baking fresh cookies though too so that will that'll attract people but yeah. um and i think that goes to show like why like merley and satish were, were talking about golden paths and like people are looking for kind of a a an approved way you know i call it you know I call them best practices still. Maybe that's the old way to, to refer to them. But you yeah. know what I mean? They're looking for a way to to navigate this that they know will work. Like it's no longer yeah. I'm here to experiment. It's like, hey, show show me how to put it together and how to work. And so some of the interesting sessions I saw were the ones where uh certain, you know, companies like Datadog went through, here's why we went down last summer, right? And they went through the the basically the RCA of how they how they broke. Right. Um, and we, we seem to have a little bit of time, so maybe we could expound a little bit further around um, what do you see as the the, the main challenges um, around uh, trying to 
adopts AI as such a strong for, uh, focus of what people are, uh, what platform engineers are trying to accomplish in Kubernetes. Um, you know, from my perspective, Kubernetes precedes so much of uh, of what was developed for AI, ChatGPT, and, and the things that are happening in AI. Uh, that's a very uh, recent, uh, uh, you know, development. Whereas if you think about where, how you know Kubernetes came into development, it was it was largely for for web-based utilization. So, um, you know, where do you where do you see the challenges as AI starts to inject itself into a common conversation from Kubernetes as a whole? So I think there's there's two it's a two-prong approach, right? There's how do we train models, and not everyone's going to do that. Right, like how do I create my own chat GPT? Like not everyone's gonna do that. Like there's models out there that are already made, like you can use them. Right. So what the challenge to the platform engineer is like, how do I get that model in the hand of my developers so they can make value out of it, right? right. And so um, what we see is, is ways for it to be easier and easier, like the demo on stage around a, a project called Olama, if anyone wants to look that up, right? It's a it's a way to run it on your Mac. Uh, sorry, Windows users, it runs on Linux and Mac only. So I'm I'm glad that the world is is moving to the right direction. And uh, sorry, no, no offense to my Microsoft friends, but the <laughs> the thing is that you have uh, you know you have the ability to run it right there inside of Minikube on your desktop, right? Now not my, not, maybe not everyone wants to do that. Like I won. I'm very I'm very picky about what I let just run on my laptop because. I do webinars and stuff, and if something ki process kicks off and it kills GoToMeeting, it looks bad, right? So, nice. so I run them in the in the cluster. So the challenge for the platform engineer, you know, that has lots of customers out there that are, you know, their internal customers, their developers that are using a platform that they've created is how do I give them an option to use this model in a way with um, the data services that they already have every day. So if it's Kafka or Postgres or, you know, some of these other stateful services, like this is another stateful service that um, you can provide that has the data built. Does that, uh, and then make, make sure I, I get that right is you train a model, right? In AI, you have yeah. this blob of files and you use that to, to program against. And right. um, you have to make that, repeatable and reliable so you can't just re you don't want people recreating it every day you want to be able to take that and put it in a place where hey i know it's going to be there so you know a stateful like we're more and more seeing like we've been saying for years this you know you're going to get the benefit of stateless with state now you know that's what portworks is all about but we're not doing the sales pitch today but is like i need to have that data available for them no matter where they spin where when they spin this up yeah Huh. Well, I think that, that that does actually, that makes a ton of sense in terms of if you're thinking about the mechanics of how, how AI functions, uh, stateful is, 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 is table stakes. Uh, you have to be able to store elements of those, those data sets to go through as you put it, the learning and training cycles. Um, it, inference doesn't get, get to happen out of thin air. Uh, it has to have something that, to, to operate against. Uh, the other thing that I, uh, it resonated at least for me around so much focus on AI uh, is that when you think about the application of of it in a variety of use cases, uh, that means that the data sets that need to be crunched might be distributed. They might be way way out on the edge if it's a you know a 5G network or if it's a uh, you know I had an interesting uh, customer meeting a few weeks ago uh, and an executive briefing and. I learned that there was a customer who is in the meat processing business and they were using uh, AI uh, and GPUs in order to, to um, you know, really ascertain what was the quality of a particular butcher's capabilities. And so the use cases are super vast, but their, their processing uh, facilities are very distributed and they're out at the edge. And so yeah. the challenge for them was to figure out how do I move this data around or how do I make it relevant uh, to where I can put a more cost-effective GPU solution in, uh, in place. Maybe that would be in the public cloud. Maybe it's a centralized data center. So this, this element of data portability, I think Kubernetes can really help with uh, when you have a, an architecture uh, or ability like Portworx can provide where you can kind of span across those. Uh, and, you know, even outside of 
just poor works, that 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 challenge still reflects itself uh, out in the marketplace. So interesting uh, elements around AI uh, and how it how it transitions into into Kubernetes as a whole. I, I picture there being you know uh, an internal developer platform where you know you will have the choice of models to be able to you spin them up and they just come up right. Like you're not retraining them. You're just like, hey, I need Llama. I need I need you know Mistral or you know whatever some of the there, and actually I went and looked it up. There's a gajillion of them now. Like, why should I ever have to train anything myself other than I don't trust anyone? But um, yeah. I probably would do it anyways. But like, wow, there's there's a lot of options out there. And so you you could build around it and and be ready to go. 100%. Um, and they're well, all, yeah. they all take a lot of data and it, you don't want to copy them back and forth all the time. I'll tell you that much. No, for sure, for sure. <laughs> uh, well, the other big focus that we saw out of the uh, out of the mentions, not not necessarily the sessions, but the mentions was uh, uh, was security. So I wanted to come back to that for a moment as well. Um, you know, wh wh why do you see uh, security as as a continuation? Uh, it, it's been in the top of the uh, of the session uh, focuses for a couple of years now. And wh where 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 does security? Why does it keep coming up to the top of the the pile, so to speak, from your perspective? I mean, it's almost like a softball. Like, why do we, you know, we're, it, it'll never go away. Fair enough. Right? The the bad people will still do things to mess things up. Like, you have to protect your, your you have to protect your software supply chain, basically your software chain. Um, you have to make sure that that's, you can account for whatever happens to your, your code as it goes through that. And, or else you, 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 just bad things happen, right? And you get people, you get people out there that are not, you do not have your best interest in mind. And so it's, it's going to be a huge thing. And so protecting that, protecting that, protecting your own internal IP and also what you can trust coming from the outside. Like, Hey, you know, I'm not recompiling Kubernetes on my own. I'm downloading, downloading it from the, you know, from a, a vendor most of the time. And so, you know, does it need to be scanned? Does do all these container images, you know, do I have, um, not so much that like, hey, I think that they have viruses or, or malware or backdoors built into them, but hey, I need to show that we um, we scanned it, we have a set of audit on it, right? And I see that that never going away. Like that should Excuse the me. fact that it the fact that it's been you know big in the last couple of years just shows like how far off we were in building security into into everything we code <laughs> around uh, around everywhere. It's so true, actually, when you do think about how things are operating, uh, there's two components. One is it's largely open source. So we're, you're going to need to have some mechanism in place to go scan for critical vulnerabilities associated with open source projects. So that there's that component. And then there's, of course, um, uh, you know, I lost my train of thought there, unfortunately, but, uh, well, you know, I could fit, I could finish that thought. At least what I think your thought is, is well, that yeah. I had this happen to me earlier today. I ran a container and I'm like, I have a, okay. Anyways, I have something that showed me where, where it's connecting to, like it connects to a database. It connects to, um, a web service. And then it also connects to an outside internet service. So I was like, why the heck is this thing dialing, dialing out? Right. And so with open source, I go through, I start cracking open the code and going, what Python packages are in this, where, you know, what is it doing? And then finding the line where it's saying, you know, it's, you know, querying something off of an API, but I'm like, why is that in there? Right. And so that's, that's what everyone wants to do. And if you, you can, that's why they want it open source, but they also want it to be automated, right? Like me doing that, that's, that's an hour of my time. I mean, we don't want, you know, if you have 10,000 developers, you don't want them all doing that. This, this does seem to reinforce yet again uh, on the various aspects of running a, a, a platform is that um, we need to get to a place where uh, it's it's easier for customers and you know individuals to find that best practice to find I keep coming back to the paved road or the golden path but like it, it, the yellow you know, road you're going to the sea the wizard road. yes we're off to see the wizard uh, you know uh, you know maybe the industry will mature in this area as well to, to come up along a, a common framework. Um, but, you know, we've seen that in other parts of the technology space where, uh, you know, to get, um, you know, GDPR certified or, or to have other certifications in the financial services industry, 
uh, you know, there's been defined paths around how do you reach that level of compliance to make that industry uh, uh, comfortable. And hopefully that's an evolution that we can start to see within this space as well uh, to establish that best practice uh, and maybe even a practice in, in general. And maybe that's a good uh, segue for us to talk about uh, SIGs. Uh, I didn't see anything that caught my attention to solve these particular challenges that we that we talked about um, in both AI as well as security, but perhaps that'll be fodder for next year at, at the conference and we'll see that uh, emerge. But um, well, there, were, there know, weren't a lot of like graduation announcements, right? Like I always call them, yeah, that's what they are, right? This is like, hey, it's gone from incubating to graduation and, uh, I didn't see anything of maybe nothing caught my eye. If there was one, I, I actually did search to see if there was more. Nothing right. caught my eye. I feel like we are reaching a, a great stage where a, a big part of the ecosystem that comes from the CNCF is is stable. Yeah. <laughs> Which is awesome. Right. Like they consider it stable. I consider it stable. You know, it's it, it's good. And so whether you're using all those parts, like some of them do the same thing, they're different projects, but uh is that you know hey you, you can put those things together you know that they're stable and they work yeah well if there's any contributors out there uh perhaps uh we'll get some uh sandbox uh, uh special interest groups next year that uh, are trying to establish uh that, that best practice or that practice in general around security to help help customers uh, navigate these elements so, uh mm -hmm. you know it's certainly a, a it's a stack that is requires you know, a lot of attention to detail because uh, the various components need to be addressed as, as you move forward. Um, one thing to add to that too is because it's stable, I'm still seeing, you know, we still see a lot. So the other, the big, other big topic that I had was observ observability. Like there's a lot of a, still like being able to log and then see what's going on. And which to me says there's still trouble. There's still a lot of troubleshooting right. happening in the world. So like while we say they're stable and they, they're you know they're they're doing great things is there's still a lot of room for making it simple easy to use um, when it comes to this space. Me and I, you know I, I think I mentioned it earlier but maybe that's where AI can really help us is to get to a place where it can do that quality control and checking uh, and and implementation of of good tooling around observation to, to drive it. Uh, ultimately, those all feed into what I see as one of the themes still. Uh, it was a theme last year, driving Kubernetes towards uh, enterprise and production use cases. Um, you know, and I think to your point, this year is maybe a, a lot about overcoming those observed challenges in productions. Whereas last year, it was a little bit more, hey, I'm still building this and I, I need to look for issues uh, in order to make it scale. Uh, but now it seems much more practical uh, versus the theoretical. Um, and I, hopefully that aligns with what, what the customers were feeling and observing as well. Um, you know, to, giving you a little more entree to talk about your conversations that you had with customers, um, did you, what were some of the challenges that, that they brought to you uh, when, when, when you were in the sessions and had, had one-on-ones uh, with customers at the booth or, or in general? So I had, I had some, you know, very memorable conversations with you know some partners and some customers so one like partner like when i say partners like pure storage partners that hey they have people that are experts in these certain areas and um you know they were there at kubecon because that's what they do they do kubernetes and they you know there's still there's still a lot of learning that needs to happen around why why we do what we do like, why do we put data in, in Kubernetes? Why we don't put it off in an external database? All those kind of things. And so while, you know, for you and I, like, that's what we talk about all day, we're still, there's still a lot of people learning that. And you could see that too from some of the sessions that, where, like, they're like, yeah, we, we uh, solved our data problem by using local paths. And, and uh, I'm like, really? So when it fails over, it's gone, right? Like, it's all in, inside the server on AWS. And I'm like... There's like so there's like a thousand different ways to do that. And so I think there's still a lot of creativity out in the world around solving that issue when we can, you know, kind of shortcut that path. There may be some pain that comes along it with it kind of like creating your own solution. So uh, one of the things is, you know, shortcutting that um, for the Portworx customers I talk to, like, honestly, you know what? I got no stump 
like in the years past, I would get like the stump the chump questions, right? Like, what if this happens? What if this, what if my blocks are on these different servers and they, they do this? Like I, I got none of that this year. What I got was, Hey, we really love PDS. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, you know, it's like, Hey, we really love this. We love how this does this. And, you know, we, you know, and then the second biggest compliment I uh, I got to other people was their CNAs. Like they would say, Hey, I love this. I love this architect. I won't name him on the call, but like, you know, it's like, we love this guy. He can do anything, you know, he'll help us out. So like, I feel like there's a lot of happy, like it makes me feel good that there's a lot of happy customers out there. And when I walk, even, even then, like the people that I met, which is cool, but then you walk through the, the venue and you see some of the sponsors and some of the other, you know, software providers that like they have SaaS services and you're like, Oh, that, you know, they're not public references. Like that's one of our customers. That's one of our customers. And, and it, you know, it's nice that like these people that are building um, great solutions. Oh, right. Yeah. You were talking about like, like, uh, like Mesmo was one of the sponsors and, and, and they're, yeah, they were the Wi-Fi sponsor. So whenever you got on the Wi-Fi, it was like Mesmo by Mesmo Wi-Fi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and my, my, booth conversations, uh, maybe because I was wearing a sports jacket and kind of being managerial and whatnot, but there were definitely people who came up to me talking about um, cost optimization and how to, uh, you know, how can they better move forward now that they're moving into production uh, to cost contain elements of their environment. And and you mentioned uh, Portworx Data Services or PDS. Uh, we actually had a had a, a customer speak at our booth. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that customer and, and how they used a PDS as a as as something that that was improving their overall delivery of services to to their customers. So yeah, they came in. I mean, obviously they're 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 using PDS, but they're using it in their manufacturing floor, right? right. And they they come. He can't you know basically. Hey, we need to standardize the way that we deploy um, databases in inside um, these Kubernetes clusters that are in these geo dispersed you know, manufacturing facilities. Yeah. So, so Rivian, right. They make, they make electric cars. It's awesome. Um, but they have Kubernetes in every place and they run, they run PDS in order to standardize the way they roll out those databases and then manage the life cycle of them, you know, down the road, whether it's backing them up, restoring them, doing those kind of things. So their real world experience means a ton to me as someone who's watched that product get mo- launched. <laughs> and like seeing happy people use it and and they're happy with it in production. That's, that's an awesome, awesome thing. An awesome example. Right. And it doesn't have to be like a, you know, 10,000 node cluster where you're running, you know, a, uh, you know, a massive data workload, right. These are, these are lots of like very specific workloads that they've built to monitor and watch and log things that are happening um, that help them build more cars. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I know that um, cost was a big driver for them, but one of the things that I saw in my conversations was that um, there were customers that were not only concerned about cost, but they were also concerned about data mobility and the ability to use data services in different locations. So I had a couple customers that were using elements of open search, but maybe were considering, hey, you know, I'm using the data service because it's a managed service and I, I love it but it's a little bit more expensive. And more importantly, I can't move that data around for different places to, to analyze it. And so I had numerous conversations talking with customers around, well, maybe I could just run uh, open search, the open source version on top of EKS. Uh, and that would allow me to then, uh, you know, move it out of the environment if I have Portworx running on top of EKS. That was a theme that I saw uh, but in general, um, multi-cloud it seemed to be a real thing. And um, we've always talked about it, uh, both in our parent company, Pure Storage, as well as in Portworks. But I, I feel like this push towards production utilization of Kubernetes is really driving that home. Um, and we had Intuit, uh, the individual from in, Intuit actually giving a presentation around how he transformed the RTO and RPO of their Jenkins environment by using Portworks to span across multiple availability zones. And that was a common theme as well, um, multi-cloud. And uh, I, I thought that was really- um, the, the future The future is hybrid or multi-cloud. That's right. Isn't that my quote? Did you just know my quote? Just because- no, I'm, you... I'm pretty sure I taught it to you. Oh, I, fair enough, fair enough. It's no, I know. <laughs> it's something yeah. we say so often. I don't, I don't know if, uh, if that even means anything anymore. Yeah, totally. 
Uh, well, we have one customer that's actually um, running an AI solution. Uh, did you want to talk about uh, talk about that one as well? I thought that was an interesting one. So yeah, that was actually um, um, Era, right? And they they're a um, they're an AI platform, <laughs> and uh, they're running they're running their you know solution on top of Portworks in order to allow you know their custom their, their tenants to consume this this um, product that they create that that allows people to consume AI. So uh, we actually so it it was cool they were at they were at um, KubeCon, but then they were actually in a uh, in a press release this week um, uh, with uh, Pure Storage and how they utilize Portworx. So that was that was pretty awesome. Uh, why don't we just talk a little bit about what do you what do you see from the takeaway here around the future of Kubernetes and and maybe potentially uh, where where do you think uh, we fit in in that in that equation and um, and maybe there's synergy there. Hopefully there is. I mean, I, I want to be gainfully employed for the next several years. Yeah. So, what, tell me what you think is the future. Um, I mean, ball. what's that? Get out your crystal like, ball. Yes, the crystal ball. Like I, I mean, I see more bare metal Kubernetes on-prem. Like yes, yeah. we're going to use a lot of cloud. There's scale and automation that we're never going to get a you know be able to just match when it comes to building on-prem. But right. I see a lot more people wanting, you know, hey, I'm not going to do it today, but I eventually want this on bare metal because I want the performance. I want the, you know, direct access into the CPUs. I don't need a hypervisor in the way. So I see a lot. I see a lot of push towards that. Right. And then, then you know, yes, we do, you know, talk about Kubevert a little bit, but I don't know if that is the the majority of workloads five years from now. Right. I see people wanting to build containers and make smart decisions about that. And going on to bare metal is going to be a way to, to be more efficient when it comes to those resources. Uh, just just what I'm seeing customers drive towards. Um, Future-wise, like I'm hoping too, that was actually, they were talking about a little bit in one of the keynotes is an LTS version. They're going to have like, if anyone's out there that's interested in it, um, they do release Kubernetes major versions like every two weeks. No, just kidding. It's like every every four months, but it it could it could really blur your mind. Like you get everything into production, and then nine months later, you're four versions behind. That that could be that can be kind of frustrating. So they're going to be they're having a survey or like a a, a group to discuss and figure out like how they lock you know kind of how some of the Linux distros are. Like hey, this is the one we're going to support for three years. Um, I know we're doing that with our with our Portworx releases. Um, I think that's a great path forward, especially when you're in an enterprise and running on-prem. And uh, even though we are building out better DevOps and platform engineering practices, like completely bouncing and, and rebuilding Kubernetes clusters every week might might not fit in in some of our customers. So stability and uh, supportability, I think we're going to see more of in the next uh, couple of years. I love it. That just means more people moving into production workloads. Um, I think going along with that, and I keep hammering on it uh, just because it just seems to be where my, my conversations gravitate. Uh, and it, I think it dovetails with the AI conversation as well, is that uh, what I loved about seeing in this space is that Kubernetes is literally everywhere. Um, it's out at the edge. It's in point of sales. It's in you know that meat processing use case that I gave a description of. It's in warehouses. It's it's in data centers and it's in the public cloud. And when you have so many different environments, it does definitely seem like it's begging for an ability uh, for vendors to come in and and really um, facilitate gluing those environments together. Um, you can certainly do uh, you know manual exports and imports across disparate uh, Kubernetes clusters and distros, but it's real real challenging. And so I think that you know, the Portworks and, 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 you know, the Red Hats of the world, we, we've got a good uh, position in that, in that marketplace to help address those particular challenges. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I think that's pretty interesting. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, the one thing I, I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll close with this um, is that in many ways, it seemed like we were in the middle of a lot of conversations around storage and what customers needed. And so when we walked down, the aisles, it was like speed dating for alliances uh, to some degree. There were so many people that we're working with uh, in those aisles. And it's just, it, it's really exciting because we're all collaborating together to try and solve critical challenges for the space and for customers. And 
many of those startups on those aisles come out of SIGs uh, and they graduate. And I just can't wait to see what the open source community is able to drive in this space. Because, you know, though I articulated a little bit that it was more vendor driven, it's important to note that the vendors and the startups are coming out of an open source community. So, you know, I heard one analyst say open source has won. And even though we had more vendors, I would 100% agree with that analyst. Uh, open source is, is definitely what's driving this space and what's feeding into all the startups that we see in, in the aisles of the solution pavilion. And uh, so for us as a, as a more established vendor, uh, it, it's great for us to be able to partner with them because in the end, what I care about most as a technical seller is how do we orient towards customer outcomes and customer solutions as a way of welcome. Okay, well, uh... Thanks to Justin and John for putting together a really informative interview there on an important industry conference. This was great. And it's as it says on the slide, you'll all be getting a link to a recording of this presentation in the next day or so. Um, and be sure to check out the links on the page to, to portworks.com to find out more about how enterprise storage makes these emerging trends and use cases possible. Also, in response to a, a question earlier from Paulina, um, I've dropped two links in the chat that, that briefly appeared as QR codes in the presentation. One is that Gartner report on uh, top st strategic technology trends for 2024 uh, on platform engineering. And the other one is for that CUBE interview at KubeCon with Portworks co-founder Merle Thiramali. So um, you can grab those out of the chat if, uh, if, if you missed the, the QR code there during the, uh, during the presentation when, when it was up on the slides. Okay, and uh, finally, it's time for the Amazon gift card prize drawing for today. And the winner of the $250 Amazon gift card this time is Ross Rafe from Georgia. So congratulations to Ross Rafe. We'll be in touch to get you your card. And with that, on behalf of the actual tech media team, I want to thank Portworks by Pure Storage for making this event possible. And thanks as always for attending. And uh, uh, that's going to conclude today's event. Have a fantastic rest of your day.